Now let's look at the hangman program we wrote in GoPigeon and let's translate it into real Go. And so here's the contains any function we wrote. And in Go, the things that are changing here is that uh, first off for your function, the parameters are in parentheses and you separate your parameters by commas. This is a parameter S of type string, a parameter called chars, which is a slice of strings. And we're returning a bool. All of the type names in this case begin with lowercase letters. And the equivalent of our for each is called for range. You strangely put the range word here at the end before the thing which we're for ranging over. And another difference is that in the GoPigeon code, we had variables i and j, which we didn't use, but the GoPigeon compiler didn't care about that. It just let us have unused variables. The Go compiler is much more picky. And so we have to use the blank identifier to say that, well, yeah, normally there should be a variable there, but we don't care about it in this case. We're not going to use it. So we use the blank identifier instead to effectively discard those values. And another difference is that in GoPigeon, we can't use for each on strings. We had to use char slice to get a slice of the individual characters as strings from our from our string. And then we could use for each on that. But in actual Go, we can for range over a string. And when we do so, um, the individual values you get, what we're what's being assigned to CH here is what's called a rune. It's actually just a 32-bit integer value, but we call them runes, and it's the it's the number representing that individual Unicode character. But it's not a string, it's an integer. And so what that means is down here in the inner loop, when we range over chars, and chars is a slice of strings, so CH2 is an actual string, and we want to do an equality comparison between CH and CH2, but they're different types, and the compiler's not going to like it if we try and compare two things of a different type. If you do an equality comparison, they have to be the same kind of thing. And so we can take our rune value, though, the, the value CH, and turn it into a string by using string like a, a function. Just like we did in GoPigeon when we, we used type names like operators. Well, it looks like a function call in Go. But anyway, so this is taking the rune value CH and getting the string equivalent and then doing the quality comparison with CH2. So that's our contains any function. Notice the use of curly braces for all of our loops in the body, and then also if has curly braces surrounding its body. Again, indentation doesn't matter. We could like mess all this up and it would still be equivalent. Compiler wouldn't care, but of course for good style, you should stick to the normal indentation style. Put everything back, oops, there we go. Okay, and then looking at the join function here, uh, here's the version in GoPigeon and then here's the Go code. First thing we do is we're checking if the length of strings is equal to zero. And we have and the len operator in Go, they don't call it an operator, they call it a built-in function, but it, it really is just like an operator. It's just syntactically, when you use it, it looks like a function call. And so that's getting the length of the strings slice. And if the length is equal to zero, then we return an empty string. Here we're declaring our variables s and last index and s is initialized to be an empty string, and last index is initialized to be the length of strings minus one. Uh, but as we saw earlier, uh, we can leave the type of these variables inferred because they're being initialized. So we don't have to say this is a string. The compiler can look at this and say, of course it's a string because that's what you're assigning to s. And we don't have to say the last index is an int because uh, the length of strings minus one, the compiler knows this is an int expression, so it's gonna be an int. Uh, and then instead of using var here at all, most Go programmers would instead just write colon equals. And same thing here. And that's standard style. Okay, and then looking at the for each loop here, the for range equivalent, again, we don't care about the index. So instead of having an index variable i, we just use the blank identifier. All we care about are the values, which we store in v. And again, we don't have to specify the types in our forged loops in GoPigeon. We have to specify that the index variable is always an integer, and we have to specify what kind of thing the value was. But in actual Go, we don't. That's why the syntax uses colon equals, for, because it's implying that the types are left inferred. Anyway, and then over here, for what we're ranging over, well, in the GoPigeon code, we used the slice operator to get a slice from our string slice, a smaller slice. So we took everything from strings starting at zero up to, but not including last index, we're doing the same thing in Go code, except the way that's denoted is with suffix square brackets, and you put the starting index before a colon and the end index after a colon. And in fact, in this case, as a shorthand, if the starting index is zero, we can leave that inferred. We don't have to write the zero there. I'm just gonna put it back here though for clarity. 
And then inside the loop, uh, oops, I made a mistake here. We don't actually need to take V and make it a string because it's already a string. The compiler didn't mind that. It was just redundant. It was totally unnecessary. Anyway, the way you concatenate strings in Go is with the plus sign, just like you're adding numbers. But the compiler knows that the things aren't numbers. It knows they're strings, so it knows you want to do concatenation. So this is concatenating V and the separator string and then concatenating that with S and storing the result in S. This is actually just shorthand for S equals S plus V plus separator. So it's taking all these things together and concatenating them and storing them in S. Finally, we have a return statement where we're taking S and concatenating it with, from strings, the, the value at last index. For a slice and also for arrays, the equivalent of the get operator is written with square brackets with no colon inside. When you have a colon inside, this is a slice operation, like here. But if you have no colon and there's just one, one value, that's an, a get operation. But we wouldn't call it that in Go. In Go, we would say this is an index operation. OK, now looking at the get letter function, it's a function which has a parameter found, which is a slice of strings. And the function returns a string. And then we have these two variables, letter and alphabet, that are both strings. and uh, we don't actually need to declare them like this. Alphabet, we could just hear when we're initializing it, use that colon equals syntax. And then same deal for letter down here where it's being assigned to, because it's uh, very importantly in this case, letter is only used inside the loop. And the way variable declarations work is if you declare a variable inside a pair of curly braces, it's only visible within that pair of curly braces. So if we tried to use letter, like if we wanted to like use letter down here, the compiler would not like this because as far as the, the compiler is concerned, this variable declared here only exists within these pair of curly braces. So this would now not be valid. If, if we wanted the variable to exist throughout the whole function, we would have to put that declaration back up here and then it could exist throughout this, the whole function. But in this case, we only use letter inside these curly braces, inside the loop. So we can put the declaration inside the loop. And also notice that instead of while, we, we just write for. There's no reserved word while in Go. We just use the word for for all of our loops and go. The condition is true. We have our pair of curly braces. And then we're getting the length of the letter, seeing if it's equal to one. And then our condition here is two parts connected by an and operation. This is the and operator. And it has a lower precedence than the equality operator here. And this function call is done first as well. So these two things are evaluated. And then the AND operation is performed. And if the result of the AND is true, then we enter the loop. So this is first testing if the length of letter is equal to 1. And this is calling the contains any function, uh, passing in the alphabet string, and then also a new slice of strings with just one individual string inside, which is letter. Letter, again, is a string. And so this is creating a slice of strings with just one single string in it. Again, when you call a function and you have multiple arguments, you separate the arguments by commas. So it contains any here has two arguments, the first alphabet and the second, this slice of strings. The update found function here has a first parameter found, which is a slice of strings, a second parameter word, which is a string, a third parameter letter, which is a string, and it returns a Boolean. And we start off declaring a variable complete of type boolean. And again, we could write this as just one statement. Here declaring a variable complete of type boolean with the initial value true. But we can leave the type inferred and we can go even further and just use the colon equals syntax. So this is how most any Go programmer would write this. And then we have our for range loop. We are looping over the so-called runes of the string word. The rune is the individual characters of the string represented as integer values. And in this case, we do actually want the index, so we'll have a variable i here rather than the blank identifier. And we're testing if letter is equal to um, the rune as a string. We have to convert it to a string so we can do the inequality comparison here. And if so, instead of the set operator to modify values within an array or slice, instead we do an assignment, and the target of our assignment is an indexing operation. We're indexing into found at, at index i but we're not retrieving that value. Instead, we're modifying the value at, at that location, and we're modifying it to be letter. So it's a little strange, because what we did as a set is instead a, a kind of assignment, as far as Go is concerned. 
And then the next if statement, we are retrieving the value at index i of found. And if it is equal to this string with a single underscore, then we will assign to complete the value false. And then after the loop, we return the value of complete. Okay, so now let's look at our main function. And our main function is making use of two new imported packages, uh, the mathrand package and the time package, both in the standard Go library. Mathrand is a package with a bunch of functions for generating random numbers. And time is a package for reading the system clock and for dealing with time values, dates and times. And down in the main function, we need those because we have this variable words, which is declared to be a slice of strings with this initial value with all these words inside it. And we want to randomly select a word from this slice. So we need to generate a random index from zero, which would be the first up to eight, up to and including eight, which would be the last word. We need a random number between zero and eight inclusive. And there was no built-in rand float operator or anything like that, like there was in GoPigeon. Instead, we need to use the rand package. And the rand package has this function int n, which given a integer value returns a random number from zero up to that number. So len of words is nine. So if we call rand int n with the value nine, we'll get a random number that's uh, somewhere in the range of zero to eight which is what we want. And that random number we get back will be stored in index. The problem is that the way the rand package works is that, well, the, ran the way random number generators work is they're not really random. They start from an initial seed value and from there they use complicated math formulas to generate a, a sequence of numbers that appears from that point to be random that's, that's very chaotic from that point, but it's deterministic. So every time you use these functions and you start with the same seed, you get the same sequence of numbers. And so we need to set our seed so that every time our program runs, it's going to be different. And so the obvious solution to that is to use the current date and time and use that as our seed because time advances always. And so as long as our system clock is properly always advancing, then every time we run our program, our seed will be different. To read the system clock to get the current date and time in the time package, there's the now function, which returns a value representing the current time. It's a, it's a time value as it's defined in that package. That's what's being stored in T here. But the seed function here from Rand is expecting this input and in 64, a 64 bit integer value, not a time value. We need to take the time and get it expressed as an in 64 value. We can do that by using the Unix nano method of the time type. Time has a method called Unix nano, which returns an in 64 value. And that value is the time represented as the number of nanoseconds that have elapsed since midnight, January 1st, 1970. So here we're calling the Unix nano method on time and the syntax for that looks like calling a function from a package, but that's not what's happening here. Here time.now, that's the now function from package time, rand.c, that's the seed function from package rand, rand.intent, that's the intent function from, from the rand package. But to call a method, uh, what we did in GoPigeon is we had a, a special operator for it, MC, and we specified the name of the method and then the, the type itself, which has the, the method, that argument is the first argument, and then any other arguments. In this case, there aren't any other arguments, just T itself. But the way it's denoted in Go is that you have what would be the first argument in GoPigeon that actually goes before the dot, and then you have the name of the method and then you have parentheses, and if there are other arguments, they go inside those parentheses, just like you're calling a function. So it's a little confusing because dot is used in Go to have a few different meanings. The general sense of dot is that if you see x dot y, then you're accessing y from x. And that's the case when you're accessing y, which is something from package x. It's also the case when you're accessing some method y of a value x, or when you're accessing some field y of a struct x. So dot has a few different meanings, but the, again, the general sense of x dot y is x is something which contains y and we're accessing y from x. Anyway, moving on, uh, now we have our random integer index, which we can use to index into words and get back an individual word. And the number of guesses in our program, as we established up here, is equal to the length of that word. 
And found here is a variable, which is a slice of strings, and it's initialized with an empty string. Because it's just being initialized with the default value for a slice of strings, arguably some people might write it like this, because that's equivalent. It's just a new variable found, which starts out with the initial value and empty slice of strings. But let's just keep it this way for consistency. Next, we have a for loop in a special form, which is goes semi-equivalent of for ink and for deck that we had in GoPigeon. And there are three components here separated by semicolons. This is the so-called precondition, and then we have a semicolon, and then we have the condition, semicolon, and then we have the so-called postcondition, and this is the body of the loop like any other. And what this is semi-equivalent to is if we wrote um, our precondition before the loop and then a regular loop with just the condition, oops, and then we had our body of any number of statements, in this case just one, and then the postcondition is it's as if it's at the end of the body. So this form here is basically just shorthand for this here. Uh, the post condition is executed at the end of the body each time through the loop. The precondition is executed before the loop uh, ever executes. And then the condition, of course, as usual, is just tested each time through the loop. There's only one subtle difference between this form and this form. And the difference is that here in this form, the variable i, this counter we're initializing, is in the scope of the loop, meaning it only exists in here. Whereas in this case, we've declared the variable outside the loop, and so i is actually existing outside the loop. So in this form, if I try and use the variable i, like if I just say I wanted to print out the variable i, I, I could do so outside the loop because it still exists out here. It's declared outside the loop, it exists here after the loop. But if I try and do the same thing with this form, like if this were my code, then the compiler gives me an error because i doesn't exist here. So that's a very subtle difference but it's the only difference. So uh, this is a loop which we have a counter variable i, starts out with a value zero. Our condition is i less than the length of the word. And then each time through the loop, we increment i by one. And each time through the loop, we're taking our found slice and appending to it a string with a single character, an underscore, and the result of the append, we're assigning to found, just like we did up in the original code. The next loop has a condition where we use the greater than operator. This is asking if n guesses is greater than zero. And if so, we enter the loop. And first thing in the function is we're calling print line and we're passing in three arguments. Uh, you may recall that earlier when we used print line, we didn't necessarily pass in three arguments, we passed in one or two. So what's going on here? Because normally functions have a fixed number of arguments they're expecting. So you can't call them with different number of arguments. Well, print line is a special kind of function called a variadic function where you can pass in a varying number of inputs. And when we write the prompt function, that'll be a variadic function too. So we'll see how you can create your own variadic functions. Normally though, functions take a fixed number of arguments. Um, anyway, so here we're calling get letter, pass in and found, and the result we're assigning to this new variable letter, which is local to this loop because it's declared inside the loop. It doesn't exist outside the loop, but that's okay for our purposes using this variable letter. And then when we call contains any, the exclamation mark in front, that is the not operator. So contains any returns a Boolean, and this not operation uh, gets us the inverse of whatever contains any returns. And then inside the body, we are decrementing n guesses by one. This is again equivalent to if we wrote n guesses equals n guesses minus one. I can't type around my microphone, this is awkward. Um, or we could also write minus equals one, and this would also be equivalent, but this is the most convenient way to decrement a variable in Go, so it's what you'll most commonly see. And then our next if, we call update found, passing in found word and letter, and if update found returns true, then we will print out this string and then word and return. And lastly, after the loop, we have this called a print line with two arguments. So the last piece missing is we need to write our prompt function but we want a prompt function to be variadic. So let's look just first at variadic functions um, by looking at the sum function we wrote and making it variadic. The way we define sum is that it's expecting a slice of ints um, as a parameter nums. And so when we call it, we create a slice of ints and we pass them in. What we want to be able to do is define a, a function sum where instead of passing in a slice of ints, we can just pass in any number of ints, zero or more of them, and just have those automatically bundled into a slice uh, which then is received as a parameter in the function. 
And the way we can do that is for the last parameter of our function, if it's a slice type, then instead of writing square brackets, we can write ellipses. And now when we call sum, instead of passing a slice of ints, the compiler is expecting us to pass ints themselves, any number of them. And in fact, we can even leave it blank, in which case uh, nums here will be an empty slice. If I just have a single argument three, now it's a slice with one value. If I have another argument, it's now a slice with two values. If I add another argument, it's a slice with three values, etc. So just all of these arguments here are bundled into a single uh, slice automatically. It's just a syntax thing. It's just a convenience. And be clear, the, the variadic parameter, the, the special slice parameter, can only be the last parameter of your function. So if I had it in other parameters here, like just say s string, just whatever, arbitrary stuff, now when I call the function, I would, let's say I'd have to pass in a string here. So in this case, 3 would be passed to a, high would be passed to s, and 4 and 6 would get bundled into a slice of ints, which would be passed to nums. Now the only problem is, having made it convenient to pass individual values as a slice without having to explicitly create a slice, well what if I have a slice that I want to pass to nums? As I do here, like say I have numbers here and I want to pass that to nums. Well, I can't just write numbers. The compiler will complain that what it's expecting here is zero or more integers, not a slice of ints. So the way to get around this is you write ellipses after the slice value. So this is my slice of ints, and I put ellipses after, and the, and the compiler knows that sum is variadic and knows that, okay, this is passing the slice itself to nums. So it's a little funny because we've created this syntactical convenience, but then there are these cases where we have to have a special syntax to fix the convenience, as we do here. Anyway, so that's variadic functions. It's really just a style thing. Uh, print line is a variadic function. It takes in any number of arguments, so I can pass in any number of things, and all of these values are being bundled into a slice. The question, though, is that you may have noticed print line, we can pass in numbers, and, and actually any sort of value can be passed into print line, because the way print line is defined is, the, this function looks like this, it's um, one parameter, we don't know what it's, we don't care what it's called, but it's variadic, and then the type is the so-called empty interface type, and the empty interface is equivalent of what in Go we called any. It's the special interface type that all values are considered to implement, even types that don't normally implement interfaces. And it kind of makes sense that they call it the empty interface because it's like saying, well, you have this interface, but it has no methods, and so automatically everything uh, it would be considered to implement it. Though I do think the, the way it's written is kind of annoying. I wish they just gave it a proper name instead of writing interface curly braces, but that's how it's written. Anyway, so I'm gonna get rid of all this. And we're going to come back here and look at our prompt function. And so looking at the prompt function, prompt is defined to be a function that takes in any number of values of type empty interface. So we can pass in whatever we want to this function and any number of arguments, and they all get bundled into the slice vowels. And the first thing we do is we test if vowels is not equal to zero. If so, if there were values passed into prompt, well, we want to print them out. And we do so by passing vowels to print line. And remember, print line itself is a variadic function taking any number of empty interface values. And we have this slice of empty interface values which we want to pass to it. We want to pass them as if we're passing them individually rather than just as one big slice. So we use this ellipsis syntax. And then what our prompt function wants to do is read from standard input. And I don't want to get into all the details here. We'll, we'll cover this stuff later. Um, but what's happening is first off, OS the standard in, that is a global variable in the OS package called standard in, which is a handle to the standard input file. The standard input file is the file that you read from when you want to read the text uh, from the console. There's also standard output, which is what you write to when you want to write out to standard console, and that's what actually print line and the print function do. Um, but we don't have any convenient equivalent of print line in, in, in the fumped package, unfortunately. There's no, nothing that uh, conveniently uh, in one function call reads from the standard input. Instead, we have to do so um, using, well, there's a few ways we can do it. One way to do it is from the buff.io package. There's this thing called a scanner, which you pass it in a file. We're passing it in here, the standard input file. And it's this thing that when we call its scan method, we get, we, we get back a scanner here, and then we're calling its scan method, and that's going to read from the file up to the first new line, which is what we want in this case. We want the user to type something at the console, then hit enter, that enter adds a new line into the text, and that's what we want to get from their text entry. 
Anyway, so scanner, we call the scan method. Notice that it doesn't return anything. It's just internally the scanner is a, is a struct that will retain the data that it read from the file. Because we're dealing with a file, we're reading and writing from a file, there's always potential for something going wrong. There's various things that could go wrong. So we have to check for the error. The scanner has an error method that you should call after calling the scan method. It returns an error value. And that error value is of type error. It's a special built-in type called error, which is actually, it's an interface type that has a single method called error. So it, it's something that looks like this. The way you define an interface type in Go looks like this. Uh, this is defining a type called error, which is an interface. And this interface will have one method called error, which returns a string, and that's it. So this is the whole interface. It's built in the language. You don't actually have to declare this. It's, it already exists automatically. Um, it's just a very simple interface type where it's something you can call its error method and it gives you back a string. And this is a useful generalization for errors because when, when bad things happen and you want to represent information about what went wrong, you might have very different needs of how to represent that information. The simplest possible solution is just to represent it as a string. But in other cases, you might need much more elaborate information. So you might create a struct that needs to store a lot more information. But what all errors have in common is that it's useful to have a string representation that we can print out so we can read what the problem was. So that's why the error interface just has a single method called error, which returns a string, a, a message describing what went wrong. Anyway, so the, the, the convention in Go is to use this error type to represent all errors. Um, if you have a function that might go wrong and you need to return an, an error, instead of using a string, we use this error type. So that's what the, the scanner type in the standard library does. This error method is returning to the variable ERR a value of type error. It's an interface value. And so if it's nil, that means there was no error. If, the, if error is non-nil, then something went wrong. Our function then needs to return the error value. We also have to return a string. But in the case of an error, we don't care what the string is, so we'll just return an empty string. Anyway, so that's how we handle errors when we read from the standard input. And then, assuming there is no error, then we can get the text that was scanned. Scanner is storing the text. Having checked for the error, as we should do, it's now OK to actually get the text that was read. And that's what we return. And in the event of success, in the event of no error, we, we return nil for the error value. So that's the convention in Go of how to handle errors. And of course, I don't actually really need this variable s, so I'm just going to do this, get rid of that unnecessary variable. OK. So having defined prompt to return not just a string, but also an error value, we actually have to go back and make those changes in the code, as I already did. So prompt here is now returning two values. The first is assigned to letter, and the second here is assigned to error. And anytime you call a function which re returns an error value, you should check if the error is not nil. Because if it's not nil, then there's some kind of error that happened, and then our function should abort. So get letter itself now needs to return not just a string, it also needs to return an error. And the event that prompt returned an error, get letter itself should return that error. And in the event that there is an error, it doesn't matter what get letter returns, it should just return an empty string. And now because get letter returns two values, it returns two things. Everywhere else where we return, we also have to return two values. And in the, the event of success, in the event of not an error, we'll just return nil, as we do here and as we do down here. And now because get letter itself might return an error when it's called, we need to go where it's called down in main. Where is it? Right here. And we store what it returns in letter and a variable error. And we check if this variable error is not equal to nil. And that means something went wrong. There was some error in reading from the console. And here back up in main is an appropriate place to decide, well, we got this error. And we need to read from the console, but we can't. So there's nothing really really we can do. We're just going to abort the program, so we're just going to return. We, we tell the user, hey, something, something went wrong reading from the console. And then we abort the program by returning from main. So that's the basic pattern of how we deal with errors in Go. And that's the entirety of our Hangman program. Let's see if we can get it to run. Hey, something's working. Pick a letter A. That's a yeah, invalid input. Uh, is this bat? No, it's cat. Hey, OK, so our program works. Cool.